This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report, with this web exclusive. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to part two of our look at a new investigation by The Nation headlined How Big Wireless Made Us Think That Cell Phones Are Safe. It reveals how cell phones were first marketed to U.S. consumers in the 1980s without any government safety testing. Then, a decade later, one of the industry's own hand-picked researchers, George Carlo, reportedly told top company officials, including leaders of Apple, AT&T and Motorola, that some industry commission studies raised serious questions about cell phone safety. On October 7, 1999, Carlo sent letters to industry CEOs urging them to give consumers, quote, the information they need to make an informed judgment about how much of this unknown risk they wish to assume. Instead, the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association reportedly tried to discredit Carlo's findings and had him physically removed from its premises during its annual conference in February 2000. The Nation investigation notes Carlo's story evokes eerie parallels with two of the most notorious cases of corporate deception on record, the campaigns by the tobacco and fossil fuel industries to obscure the dangers of smoking and climate change, respectively. For more, we continue with our interview with one of the authors of the new investigation, Mark Hertzgard, the nation's environment correspondent and investigative editor. So, Mark Hertzgard, if you could reiterate, at this point in 2018, as you evaluate the science or talk to the scientists who are evaluating it, what do you think is of most concern about cell phones? And then talk about ways to mitigate um, your um, the effects of cell phones. Sure. I, I want to emphasize I'm not a scientist. I'm, I'm a journalist and an author, but we talk to a lot of scientists. And our story does not say whether, sci whether uh, cell phones are safe or not. We looked at the industry disinformation and propaganda campaign that for the past 25 years has been convincing the public that these cell phones are safe. And the way they've done that is to war game the science, as they put it in an internal memo from Motorola. They funded their friendly scientists. They've attacked critical science, independent science. They've put their own people onto advisory boards. All that said, uh, that's resulted in, I think, the message coming across from the mainstream media, frankly, that uh, cell phones are, are safe enough, shall we say. Um, however, that uh, point of view took a major hit. Just last week, the night before we released our story, there was a peer review by independent scientists of the biggest study that the United States government has had to date on cell phone radiation. This was a study by the U.S. National Toxicology Program. That's part of the National Institutes of Health. The study was commissioned by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and uh, released some preliminary findings in February. And then those findings were peer reviewed by independent scientists last week. And those independent scientists finally concluded that there was, quote, clear evidence, unquote, clear evidence that cell phone radiation can cause cancers. And notably, those independent scientists upgraded the confidence level of that and other findings by this National Toxicology Program. So what that uh, seemed to do was to confirm the suspicions by outsiders that the National Toxicology Program brass, the people up at the top, were trying to downplay this study because it was the very same data that had been released uh, in 2016, and when the that data was released in 2016. It came with a public health warning by the National Toxicology Program. Then in 2018, and back in February, uh, they tried to downplay this. So it's very significant that last week these independent scientists said, oh no, there is clear evidence here that cell phones can cause cancer. Now, before you all worry out there that uh, you're, you're having the equivalent of a cigarette um, habit, let me just say that um, the evidence is not yet definitive of how much, uh, how high the risk is for cancer and genetic damage is another concern here. Um, but it is definitely, it seems, a risk. If you look at the scientific uh, data that is compiled by the National Institutes of Health, the actual studies that they catalog there, the vast majority of them do indicate that there are health 
impacts of this technology, of this radiation, I should say, uh, according to Henry Lai, a professor at the University of Washington who's uh, analyzed all of this, and we talked with him in some detail. So there are things you can do. The main thing you can do as a consumer is to minimize your use of your cell phone. Use a landline telephone whenever you can, and if you must use a cell phone, always use earbuds, and use it for as little time as possible. Don't go on and on. Have your phone call and complete it. And uh, in general, you want to try and minimize the risk. Uh, that's as, uh, I, again, I am not a, a, a pediatrician. I'm not a, a doctor here. You can talk to organizations like the American Pediatrics Association, which, by the way, told the Federal Communications Commission five years ago that they needed to revisit this question because their standards weren't adequate. The FCC has not done that. But you can talk to them. You can talk to a group well, called the Environment Health Trust. That, and they will give you more information on this. That's really interesting that you talk about the FCC and they haven't done that because the former head of the FCC, the Federal <coughs> Communications Commission, is was Tom Wheeler. In 1999, then the president of the Cellular Telecommunications and Internet Association, Thomas Wheeler, uh, spoke to ABC News 2020. Uh, listen carefully. I mean, I believe that the cellular phone is safe. Our industry has gone out and aggressively asked the question, can we find a problem? And the answer that has come back is that there is nothing that has come up in the research that suggests that there is a linkage between the use of a wireless phone and health effects. So that was, yes, Thomas Wheeler, who was President Obama's pick as FCC chair, speaking to Brian Ross on ABC, uh, Mark Hertzgard. Can you talk about his role? And that was a lie. That was a lie that Mr. Wheeler told. We spoke with Mr. Wheeler for this story. He gave us an interview, but insisted on putting it off the record, except for one statement that said that he followed the recommendations of the Food and Drug Administration, which uh, had found no uh, dangers from health phones. But what he told Brian Ross in that story, that there had been, that they went out and aggressively questioned uh, the science, was there a problem? That part was true. But to say that they found no such evidence, that was an absolute lie. And I use the word lie uh, deliberately. He knew perfectly well by that time that he had been told by George Carlo, the scientist, that there were serious questions from their own $28.5 million research program. And uh, so to me, the, this, the career of Tom Wheeler is an interesting illustration of a very old story in Washington, D.C., about how the regulatory agencies of the federal government get captured by the very industries that they are supposed to regulate. So Wheeler left the industry and later went on to head the FCC for President Obama. Um, and in the meantime, it's gone the other way around. The FCC uh, person, uh, vice president at the FCC, I guess, or vice chair, rather, uh, Baker, uh, came to now runs the trade association. And this is why uh, the Harvard uh, study on this by Norm Alster calls the FCC a captured agency. They have been captured by the industry they're supposed to regulate. And the single best example of that that I can give you is the FCC does not even independently test the radiation levels on these phones. They take what the industry claims and just put it on their website. That is not good enough. Part of the reason that we're down this road all the way we are so far is that we did not test cell phones back in the 1980s before they went on the consumer market. And we're about to make that same mistake again with 5G technology. Well, can you explain what 5G technology is? Sure. 5G means fifth generation. And that's the next generation of the technologies that have been used for cell phones and wireless going back into the 1990s. And where people might have heard of it uh, most is 5G technology is what will be uh, required if we go to this thing called the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is the idea of your smartphone being connected to your smart car and your smart household so that all of your appliances, your cell phones, your computers, everything will be connected 24-7. So that uh, you can, while you're driving home, you can turn on the oven 24-7, uh, 
25 minutes from home so that it's nice and warm and you can make your dinner when you get home. Uh, that seems like it's a kind of a convenient idea, perhaps. But uh, when we did the reporting on this, my colleague Mark Dowie went to the conference of the industry and saw, and we have this picture in the Nation magazine story, uh, saw a picture of a, of a baby, a doll, uh, wearing a diaper. And at the crotch of the diaper is a little transmitter. So this transmitter, under the 5G technology, Internet of Things, this transmitter will send a little message to mom or dad in the next room that, oh, the baby's diaper needs changing. Well, do we really need that? And do we really want to be, have radiation going from our baby's crotch to our cell phones? Uh, why don't we just walk into the next room and check for ourselves? In January 1993, David Reynard of Tampa, Florida, sued the NEC America company. Speaking on national TV, Reynard said his wife's NEC phone caused her lethal brain tumor. Let's go to a clip from ABC News' 2020 investigation that aired in 1999 that begins with Reynard. Tumor was exactly in the pattern of the antenna. David Reynard went on to almost single-handedly create a national scare when he filed a lawsuit and went public with his allegations. Well, we're, we're suing the carrier, we're suing the manufacturer. There was great alarm on Wall Street. And even though Reynard's lawsuit was later thrown out by a judge for a lack of reliable scientific evidence, it left the cell phone industry with a huge public relations problem. So, uh, Mark, could you comment on that and also uh, the distinction, if there is any, uh, in terms of possible risks of uh, using a cell phone to talk as against using it for uh, email or for texting? Is there a difference from what you've learned uh, about possible risks? That's really where the industry, wireless industry's propaganda campaign was launched. Because as Brian Ross's report just showed, they had a huge public relations problem at that point. Um, it was there were congressional subcommittees beginning to investigate. The, the stock on Wall Street was tanking. And that's when Tom Wheeler stepped up and immediately told uh, a hastily con uh, gathered press conference, cell phones are safe, but we're going we're gonna to revalidate that with this new science. And that was how they then found George Carlo, the scientist who they hired to, to do that. And it's interesting, George Carlo, I wouldn't call him a whistleblower exactly, but he, he certainly did not work out the way that the industry had hoped. They had hired him uh, because he seemed like, by his own acknowledgement in our interviews with him, he seemed like an industry guy. And they thought that because he had previously done studies uh, in which he said dioxin was uh, not terribly harmful in small quantities. Dioxin, of course, was behind the Love Canal and the Agent Orange scandals, one of the most toxic chemicals on earth. He'd also said that uh, breast implants were not necessarily dangerous. So he seemed, George Carlos seemed like the kind of guy who would return a friendly verdict for the industry, and then he did not. And that is really where their ways parted. And uh, Carlo eventually told the truth, both to Brian Ross and to us, and in a book, uh, cell phone radiation, if you, uh, listeners want to uh, check that out. Now, to your question, Amin, about uh, the differences, again, I'm not a scientist here. I'm a little uncomfortable uh, talking about that. There are plenty of places where you can go to get good information on this. I'd recommend the National Environment Trust is one. The American Pediatrics Association has also raised concerns about this. However, uh, I, I do know this from sources that we've interviewed on this story, that you want to always wear earbuds if you're going to use a phone. You want to minimize your use of the phone. And yes, texting is better than a phone call uh, in terms of the amount of radiation you're exposed to. And also, the moment of the connection of the call is when there is the biggest surge of radiation. That is, after you've dialed and you hear it ringing and then it connects to the other phone, that, at that moment, Hold that phone away from you. The farther away it is from your skull, the less radiation that is going to be uh, touching you. But again, the main thing is to just limit your use of all of this to the maximum extent that you can. Use landlines when you can. You know, the world still spun on its axis. We all had our lives before there were cell phones. 
You can do it, folks. I wanted to ask you about the criticism of your piece. Dr. David Gorski, a surgical oncologist at Barbara Ann Carmano's Sun Cancer Institute, wrote a piece for his blog, Science Based Medicine, criticizing your report. His post is headlined, The Nation Indulges in Fear Mongering About Cell Phones and Cancer. In it, Dr. Gorski writes, An article published last week in The Nation likens wireless telephone companies to tobacco and fi fossil fuel episodes and their tactics of spreading fear, misinformation, and doubt regarding the science of cell phone radiation and health. To produce this narrative, the investigation's authors rely on unreliable sources and cherry-pick scientific studies, ignoring the scientific consensus that cell phone radiation almost certainly doesn't cause cancer, all the while disingenuously claiming that they aren't taking a position on the health effects of radio waves. And Dr. Gorski continues, the idea that the radio frequency electromagnetic radiation used by cell phones and wireless networks is somehow causing horrendous health effects in humans, be it cancer, brain, breast, or other, behavioral problems, mental illness or whatever is like anti-vaccine pseudoscience, a claim not supported by evidence that just will not go away, says Dr. Gorski. Your response to that, Mark Hertzgard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Gorski, for providing such a illuminating illustration of the very kind of disinformation campaign we're talking about here. We're not scientists, but maybe he would revisit his blog post uh, if he looked at what the peer review of independent credentialed scientists just said last week about the National Toxicology Program's finding. They said, quote unquote, clear evidence, clear evidence that cell phone radiation causes cancer. Uh, we are not cherry picking. That is exactly what the biggest study ever funded by the United States government has said about this. And it was not what the government agency was trying to say. The government agency was trying to retreat from that position, and it's only because of peer-reviewed scientists on the outside that we know that. Go back and read our piece and compare it to the, the, the Good Doctor's blog. I'm very confident that our reporting stands up. Well, Mark, I know you have to take your daughter, Kiara, to school. Congratulations on her 13th birthday today. Does Kiara have a Indeed. cell phone? She has a cell phone that I will say her mother gave her <laughs> for my objection. Oh boy, we're not going uh, there. And we're not going to go there, but she is uh, limited on the cell phone and has, uh, is, knows that you must always use earplugs and uh, earbuds rather and uh, to limit the, the usage. So we, we try and analyze it like that. And she has promised to watch this show and to read the nation piece, and we're going to revisit all that. I, I understand this is something that is in every household in America. And by the way, we didn't talk about this, but they also deliberately addicted their customers to this technology. Just like the cigarette companies, the tobacco companies added nicotine to cigarettes, the wireless companies deliberately addicted people to this technology. They've admitted that. Sean Parker at Facebook talked about that in, in November. And they are now regretting that, some of those individuals. But the fact remains that this is a highly addictive technology. And they were told 20 years ago that this could cause cancer in kids. And they kept doing it. Think about that. Think about that. Well, let's end with Sean Parker, who was speaking at an Axios event in Philadelphia last year, Facebook's founding president, Sean Parker, uh, who said Facebook was deliberately designed to hook users. That thought process was all about how do we consume as much of your time and conscious attention as possible. And that means that we need to sort of give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while um, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post or whatever. And that's going to get you to contribute more content. And that's going to get you, you know, more likes and comments. I mean, it's a, it's a, val it's a social validation feedback loop that, that it's like a, I mean, it's exactly the kind of thing that a, that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in, in human psychology. It literally changes your relationship with society, with each other, with, you know, it, 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 it probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. It, God only knows what it's doing to, to our children's brains. That's Facebook's founding president, Sean Parker, uh, talking about how the site was deliberately designed to hook users.
Uh, that does it for our interview with Mark Hertzgard, the nation's environment correspondent and investigative editor. We will link to the nation's new investigation, which he co-wrote with Mark Dowie, headlined, How Big Wireless Made Us Think That Cell Phones Are Safe. Mark Hertzgard is the author of seven books, including Hot, Living Through the Next 50 Years on Earth. To see part one of our discussion with Mark Hertzgard, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.